2002 California Fontana Speedway, you crash. What are your symptoms and how long does it go on for? Back then, you know, we didn't hear the word concussions that often. We didn't talk, you know, and, and so when I crash and I get out and I'm like, oh man, I feel like I got my bell rung. You don't think this is dangerous. This is something I need to see a doctor about. You don't think of those things. You get out and you go, oh man, that, that was a hard hit. Wow, guys, you know, I feel, you know, lightheaded and, and woozy. And it's almost in a boasting sort of manner, like, I'm still ticking, you know, I'm still here, boy, we're gonna go get them next week. And I remember the crash being super, it was like a shotgun going off right next to your ear. When the, when the car hit the wall, it was just a nasty impact. And I'm, I got something wrong with me that I don't know, that I don't recognize. It's something, in, something wrong with my body that I can't recognize and don't understand. But I remember when I got out, um, standing upright was, uh, gave me a really bad headache. And so I had to kind of put, lean over and put my, the further, uh, the further, the lower I put my head, it seemed to be more comfortable. I had been hurt before and injured before and had concussions before and it just would go away. You know, you just waited on that to go away. There was no, uh, we, I didn't have the personal knowledge uh, and, the, and the instinct to go get that looked at. 2012 Kansas Speedway, the test, what are you thinking when your tire blows, when you're going 190 miles per hour straight towards the fence? And then describe the feeling right after. It's not any fun. It's not any fun at all to talk about this. Um, because every day while you're doing normal things, you're analyzing yourself. Simple things that everybody forgets every day. Your keys, where you put something, the number of something, somebody's name, somebody's birthday. Simple things that we all forget. When that happens to you post, you know, post head injury, you always wonder whether that's part of the injury that's just never going to come back. And so my, my doctor calls when you tie something to the injury a doctor calls that putting it in the concussion bin, and that's a bad habit for someone who's had a head injury. So talking about this, when, I, when writing that book was, torture would be a bit of a strong word, but it was not fun and comfortable to sit there and just sort of rehash all this and really get back into the depth of it, you know, the real details of it, and you know, remembering a lot of things that we went through because it kind of brought it all back and made it all fresh. And so, to get to your question, we were testing at Kansas. We were averaging laps around 190 miles an hour. So down a straightaway, we were probably doing about 210 at the end of the straightaway. I got down to the end of turn one and I. Just as soon as I lift off the throttle and, and set weight, the right front tire exploded and the car sets down on the splitter. And when it lays on that splitter, that splitter is like a, a ski on snow, you know, and it's just going. There's, it doesn't slow down. It doesn't, you know, there's no way to, you touch the brakes, it doesn't do anything. And I remember like the thinking as I was heading toward that fence, like this, this is going to be, an insane, insane impact. And I hit the wall at 190 miles an hour and the head, you know, my head is right against that headrest and it's as stiff as a roll bar. I might, you know, it's, it, and so my head didn't go anywhere and everything inside of it went into, you know, high speed, you know, movement into the, you know, and, and my brain just compacts against the, the inside of my skull at an incredible force. A buddy of mine, uh, Brad Keselowski, was racing there too. He was testing too. He came driving up in a rental car. He said he thought it sounded like a plane crash. Yeah, it was a. It was it. That, that is the. 
I mean, there's not any situation that I can think of that would result in a harder impact in racing. And if it doesn't happen to me, I probably don't have, you know, I probably don't cut my career short. I probably, probably still drive race cars today. But that wreck um, made me, made it easier, I think, for me to be, uh, you know, to get concussions beyond that, beyond that instance, so. Take me through the feeling from right after that wreck to yeah. the restaurant, the limo, I was, uh, and, and the next race weekend? The, I have this feeling like I am con I'm disconnected from reality around me. Like, I'm, like when somebody's talking to me, I'm just kind of like staring through them. And I can't hear what, I can't even pay attention to what they're saying because I'm thinking about what, what, what is this feeling I got in my head? What's going on in my head? This is a weird feeling. Why am I feeling this? What, is this serious? We went, there's a barbecue joint outside the racetrack. We decided to go have lunch there. So literally 30 minutes after the crash, I'm, we're at the table. And I'm still feeling like this weird sense of being disconnected from my surroundings. And it's really worrying me and it's bothering me. So I'm thinking about it and I'm wondering what's going on with me and how I feel. And so I'm not listening to any of the conversation around me and even the people that are talking to me. And so. And, and then you start getting anxiety, right? Because you think people are yeah, like my looking at you. Now, yeah, so you start thinking, one of the ways that I would sort of analyze this with someone was drinking. Sometimes maybe you're having some drinks and you feel really inebriated and you're wondering if anyone in the room sees how you feel. You know, they, are you the drunkest guy at the party? And so that's the kind of feeling that you have in that scenario where I'm sitting there at that barbecue place. I'm like, man, I really feel screwed up. And I'm wondering if everyone else is looking at me like, man, he looks bad. You know, and so your anxiety is going through the roof. And then and anytime you have anxiety, that makes all the symptoms in a concussion, triple, double, you know, whatever, just go haywire. And so this anxiety is making me feel worse and I got sick, I got nauseous. I don't ever get nauseous. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, I gotta get up out of here. This is driving me crazy. Uh, everybody, all this noise and all these people. And, and luckily right in that moment, my wife and a friend of mine walked into the, the restaurant and I was like, is there, did y'all bring a car here? They're like, yeah, there's a limo. I'm like, oh, thank God, I'm gonna go lay in this limo. And so I told Steve Latardis, man, I'm going, I got to get out of here. I'll explain in a minute or whatever. And I went and laid down in this car. I spent the next probably three weeks dealing with the symptoms and racing and not feeling great. And then a, a four, after four weeks, I finally woke up one day and was like, I'm, I feel completely clear. That was four weeks longer than I thought it would take. You know, I'd crashed and had my bell rung before and it would go away within hours or a day. And so for it to be four weeks of obvious symptoms that I could feel every single day, that was really alarming. And I just wasn't, I didn't tell anyone and I kept it to myself. And, and, and then it happens a couple weeks after that well, at, right, at Talladega. And I, then, when I went to Talladega, that Friday uh, was the day I woke up. I was like, I feel good. Yes. All right, we're at Talladega, which is a crash. At Talladega, there's like an 80% chance you're going to crash, right? And so with these symptoms, my whole goal was to not hit anything at all at any point during those weeks, right? I'm trying to get through the race instead of win the race. And here we are coming you know, toward the final lap and I'm, I'm like four wide. I mean, everybody's two, three wide. This is, everybody's in this na nasty, gnarly pack, you know, and I'm right in the middle of it and I'm like, oh, you know, this is getting the finish line, not crash. And sure enough, uh, these guys get you know, together up front and the whole field's crashing and it, 
and the, the momentum carries them all up against the wall and we're all just kind of banging into each other, but everything's cool. It's not really any real nasty hard hits, just kind of banging around in there and I'm, I'm sandwiched between another guy and another guy and the wall and cars in front of me and cars are hitting me in the back and we're all just kind of sliding on down the hill, you know. And some, uh, Bobby Labonte's coming along on the apron and he's trying to miss the wreck, you know, and he's not in it. He's, he's so far so good and I slid down in front of him and he hit me in the right behind the seat, kind of in the left rear tire hit me and it spun my car around really fast and I felt it immediately in my head and I my symptoms were different than they were four weeks ago at Kansas now I have symptoms of anger and like this emotion like I can't control right and I get I'm mad as hell because I'm like god I'm like I just spent four weeks going through this crap and now I'm I'm, it's like I got to start all over again and I couldn't control my anger and my emotions. That was new. Yeah, that was new. I mean, that was that is ridiculous. I don't even want to go to Daytona or Talladega next year, but I ain't got much choice. I got out of the car and I'm like, I don't know why we're racing. This is not racing, you know. I called it bloodthirsty and like the, I was blaming NASCAR for all this crashing and every time we come here we wreck on the last lap. And the, you know, the officiating body needs to fix this type of racing because this is what happens every time we come here. And so it's usual for drivers to get out and complain, but it's, it's unusual to be that aggressive about it. And Especially you. Yeah, and so I almost got, I almost got a fine for those comments. And um, fortunately, I didn't, but um, I definitely got a conversation about it. Uh, I remember on the ride from the inside of the track to the airplane knowing like thinking in my mind like I am I am right I am messed up again you know and this is feels different and that would that was just one of a lot of scenarios like that over that period of time. Whether it's uh, balance, eyesight, sinus pressure, nausea, anger, driving ability, memory, when, when the symptoms were the worst in 2014, what were you experiencing? In 2014, the worst would be f like feeling drunk. Like it felt like I had drank. It felt like I was not able to do the simplest tasks around the house or at home because I was drunk, buckling a belt, tying a knot in a shoe lace was a challenge. Like you're, um, you know, you, you couldn't put a sentence together because you couldn't remember a word. If you had a word with like two consonants together, like, like or even three, like match or something simple, you would struggle like sometimes saying those words, your tongue would feel like it was a big balloon in your mouth. My eyesight problems would be um, if I looked at something very close to me, like your shoe, and then looked at something outside, out in the yard, it, my, it would take my eyes a few seconds to focus on that item. And then to come back to your shoe real close to me, it'd take my eyes a second, you know, it's too slow. Why didn't you tell anyone, not even your now wife? Yeah, I was scared to death. You know, I was just really frightened. I was, um, I wasn't ready to let everyone know that that was going on. I was hoping that it would go away, you know? This may be wrong and, and, and a bad comparison, but I think if you had any kind of illness, you might, you know, you wouldn't be so ready to share that with people. You might need some time to yourself to process it before you were open about it and, and ready to get into the details of what this all means going forward. The other part of that too is trying to explain this problem to someone who's never had a concussion or never experienced these problems is really frustrating. 
and trying to tell even my wife that my eyes aren't working and this is what they're doing. It just really builds a ton of frustration inside. It's because you're frustrated having the issues, right? You're frustrated with them happening. You're mad inside about it yourself. And now trying to explain to someone who's not a doctor and not really someone that can, can do anything about it, even though she's my wife and I love her to death, it just does me no good to share it with someone, anyone, who can't help me. What was your reaction when you found out in 2014 that he had been hiding a lot of the symptoms from you? Part of it was a little bit of anger. I was annoyed with him. Obviously, I want him to share everything, and that's not something you hide. It's really severe and serious, and um, he should have been treating it versus hiding it. And then I was relieved a little bit because I could tell there was something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. So now we finally had something to work from. What do you remember from the conversation when he told you for the first time what was going on then? I remember being a little confused and just asking a lot of questions. He had so many notes that he had saved in his phone. It was easy for him to explain it to me. Mm -hmm. um, but from that moment, my only thoughts were, OK, let's, how, how do we fix this and who do we call? Surely there's a plan here. What do we do? How much of why you were taking notes on your iPhone was to leave a trail in yeah. case something really bad actually ended up happening? I felt compromised, you know, in my head. I felt um, delicate. And if I was to have another random, rare, high impact crash that could uh, injure me severely, so severely that I wouldn't be able to communicate properly, um, I wanted someone to, I wanted there to be some sort of documentation of what had been happening to me and what I've been going through, whether that, you know, would serve any purpose other than just for people to have some knowledge, I guess. And But that was a conscious decision yeah. you made. You hadn't I told anybody doing that, you wanted. I was doing that out of fear, you know. I was, I was writing that down just out of fear. Uh, of what? Of what was happening to me, you know. I mean, I'm, you're, I'm scared, you know. I, I'm, I was having these simple little crashes that were giving me problems why? And you know, why am I not able to deal with these crashes that everyone else around me can deal with and I used to be able to deal with? Um, and so let me write this down, and that way it was there on paper, and I could say, all right, it's Thursday. I'm getting ready to fly to the racetrack. Sunday, I can see, was real bad. Monday, Tuesday, getting better, getting better. Clear Thursday, feeling pretty awesome on Friday. You know, that was just a way for me to draw a timeline of my improvement or progression through each incident. And that way, if it was helpful to my doctor at some point, any point, if I ever, he ever needed this information, because I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be able to remember, you know, be able to remember it mm -hmm. precisely. It's kind of crazy that, I mean, he is so very self-reflective, but the ability to analyze, especially when you're not feeling well, how, why, what, like all of those things kind of blew me away. It's definitely not something I would do. Um, and then seeing it put together like that was really scary too. This was around the time too when CTE was really popular to be talked about. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was part of what drove him to write everything down, just in case he forgot, just in case it got somewhere he couldn't control. Obviously, we wouldn't have, wouldn't have known to look for it. But I think that all of those things just made him want to be really careful and cautious and write it all down. At the height of the symptoms in 2016, what was the worst? The balance, uh, you know, to get up out of this chair and turn and go to the door was uh, dreadful. Um, Every time you stood up or got up, you felt like you were, you knew you were gonna get dizzy. You knew you were gonna have to hang on to something and you knew it was gonna make you sick on your stomach. Driving down the road, riding on this road, if, if you know there's a road sign, we're driving toward this road sign, road sign on the interstate, me trying to look at the road sign, my, my eyes just bounced. And so I couldn't keep my, like 
as we're driving up to this road sign, my eyes are just bouncing all over the place. And if I was to look over at cars coming at us, they're just, my eyes couldn't stay still and look at an object and watch the object go by and watch the road sign go by. You know, my eyes are just bouncing all over the place. And so your eyes are tethered together. When you look left, they both go left, right? When you look up, they both go up. But my eyes didn't work, to work together. And, and at this point, you can't drive yourself. You can't oh, go to no, the grocery no. store by yourself. Yeah, you no, are, no. There you was no chance dependent. in hell I could yeah. drive anywhere or go do anything like that. And I had these symptoms for four months till they started to improve. What did the treatment and rehab entail? Uh, in 2016, we were having a really unique year where I had been caught up in a lot of crashes, more than normal. And so every one of those are starting to give me issues. It's like just a little, just a, just a 20, just a bump of 20 Gs is giving me issues, you know, and, and that should be something that any driver can just not even think about, you know, that I'm having issues with some of the simplest impacts and they're going away, but they're, you know, two, three, four weeks later, have another crash or run into something and I'm back, you know, having issues again and again and again. So I always thought that, you know, when you got a concussion or you're going to have problems, you you noticed it right after the impact or at least a day after a crash or they were always they were always married to an impact or an instance right so here i am i ain't had a crash in three weeks but man i'm feeling weird i'm like wondering what in the hell is this so i talked to my crew chief and i said i'm feeling this weird i'm feeling these weird symptoms man i don't know what this what this means for this weekend. If I'm getting worse and worse, I don't know if I can drive a car feeling this dizzy. Let's get a friend, let's get a buddy of mine to be ready to drive the race car if I can't. And he's like, okay, well, you know, let's, okay. Try to call Rick and let him know. So I called my boss, Rick Hendrick, and I said, hey, I got this happening and I'm gonna try to get my buddy ready in case I can't drive, he's gonna drive the car. And my boss is like, are you crazy? Like, why, why are you not already talking to the doctor? Get your ass to the doctor and figure out what the hell this is. So I was like, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I need to be doing. Why am I not at the doctor? You're right. So I went to, uh, I scheduled an appointment with Dr. Petty. Me and my wife drove to Charlotte to see him. And by this time, I'm dizzy and having problems with my balance and walking. Uh, getting out of the car and walking to the door of the, of the hospital, you know, I got to have a oh, shoulder on somebody or turning a corner in the hall. I'm hanging, I'm like hands on the walls, you know, to stay up. Any head movement of turning or up and down, you know, left to right would just turn the world upside down. And so we were thinking maybe it was something else. Uh, they talk about these rocks in your ears that kind of get you know, dislodged and need to be resettled. Mm -hmm. Vertigo. So he put me through a bunch of scenarios trying to figure out if that was it, and we couldn't, recre we couldn't recreate the, the problem, which you could, with vertigo, you can find whatever movement it is and keep doing it and keep recreating it. And there it is, vertigo. And uh, one time a driver, Terry Labonte, had vertigo and he went and rode a roller coaster for an entire day and it retrained his mind and resettled that issue in his ear, his inner ear, and fixed it. Well, Right. So I'm hoping that that's what I got to do, right? Just right. let that be it and I can fix it. But we couldn't recreate that issue and he's like, man, I think you really have some, uh, you know, you have some sort of a head injury here that's, and I did an impact test, and an impact test is about a 30 minute test on a computer. And it tra uh, basically, uh, you're, you're told a lot of words, uh, you're supposed to remember these words and then uh, recite them or, or you know, be asked about these words, minute, you know, 30 minutes, 15 minutes later or whatever, and, and uh, same thing, you're asked about the shapes, numbers, 
Uh, you play like a matching game. There's all kinds of scenarios and things you're doing. And so we take an impact test in NASCAR when we're healthy, and that's the baseline. And then when you have a crash or an instance, I can have you take the test again and decide whether you're deficient in some of these areas. And then I'll know that you have an injury or you may have an injury and let's look a little further. So I take this impact test and we realize that, yeah, I've got some problems. He's like, yeah, you, we need to send you to Pittsburgh to see Mickey Collins, which is the doctor I saw in 2012. I've been in steady contact with Mickey since 2012 up to this point. So I'm like, great, I love to go see Mickey again. I know uh -huh. that Mickey can fix this or Mickey will help me and I'm starting to feel better, anxiety's starting to come down. And so I think Dr. Petty called Rick and said, Dale ain't gonna drive this weekend. We're going to see Mickey. I went to see Mickey probably every other week or every three or four weeks. I was on some medications that would bring my anxiety down and keep my anxiety really low so that the symptoms would kind of get numb. Anytime you have any kind of anxiety, the symptoms get really flared up so that the medication would keep the, the symptoms down to allow me to, you know, just have a decent day. And um, they would put me through a bunch of physical exercises to try to, try to stir the symptoms up and make the symptoms happen. And the ones that made the symptoms flare up, I would take home and do. So I would do these exercises, and they were just normal in a gym exercises, throwing around a rape ball, a lot of head movement, tossing it over your shoulder, picking it, getting this, you know, look at your head there. You're turning your head up, and you're going up and down, and then putting the, putting the ball up, the, you know, just simple stuff where you're moving your head around. And we would turn the lights out and turn a disco ball on and make the environment as complex as possible and do these exercises. And that was really triggering all the symptoms, you know, and you just keep doing them until the symptom, your body would just basically learn to deal with this environment, right? And you're, you were learning your balance all over again. And then I would, some, once the, you know, I'd go back to see Mickey and we would see what new exercises they could give me to, to trigger them issues again. And uh, we had to do them every day. I had a computer program and glasses that I wore with this program that worked to tether my eyes back together. And it, it, were, it involved a lot of 3D. Um, the glasses were 3D and it involved taking objects and going, the objects would go from 3D and, and uh, they, would, they would kind of go back to, to normal. Um, it would make your eyes physically hurt as, they, as those objects are trying to pull your, eye, your eyes apart. And it felt like that. It felt like they were, it felt like this, the things that I was having to look at and watch were like trying to rip my eyeballs apart. And it was strengthening that tether between them, that, that there, it was making them forced to work together, you know, and, and doing those, uh, doing that really helped with the, the visual stuff. It's stuff that would make anybody feel weird, but it made me really had to work hard, my mind had to work really hard to, to gain these, you know, simple functions back. When was the last time you had any symptoms? Earlier this year, we went to Martinsville Motor Speedway for the race. And so I haven't had anything that's made me think about symptoms in a long time, you know, weeks, maybe even a month. So we go into the racetrack and we get down into the pits and they start practicing. I, we went over to the pit wall and we're literally 25 feet from the cars going by in the corner. But I'm watching the cars go by and they're going, and I'm standing there and I'm, th I'm going, man, I am, I wanna grab a hold of something. I feel sick to my stomach. I wanna get away from this area. I wanna back up and get far, far away from these cars. We got away and went and stood up on top of this truck and after about 30 minutes it all was, you know, I felt better and my anxiety went down, and, but I was so freaked out. Because the symptoms in 2016 came on like a cold or a flu. They didn't, it wasn't like hit a wall, oh, I messed up. It was like a slow progression that wasn't even tied to an impact. And so ever since then, I've got this fear in me that this is all could come back. It came, it came, it came on its own. Then it could come back again, you know, at some point in my life. How concerned are you about the long-term health consequences from having 
gotten so many concussions? I'm real concerned about what this means for me as I get older. You know, am I going to uh, have issues with my memory and my personality? Uh, is that gonna, you know, are those things gonna be affected? Are they already affected and I'm just not aware of it, you know? Um, I worry about that. I read a lot of articles about all athletes that deal with that stuff or athletes that are old and, and, and retired and that are dealing with it, are seeing changes in themselves. I can't stop myself from reading about other people's experiences. And I will always be curious about what people are dealing with that have had concussions and how they're experiencing. I want to I want to be equipped, I guess, with knowledge. When if you had to guess, how many concussions do you think you've had? I would say any it may be twenty to twenty five. I would say. How many of those do you think NASCAR was aware of? The majority of those, I wouldn't have told anybody about, you know. And how concerned were you at various times of your career that if you did tell somebody about a concussion you thought you had, that it could negatively impact your Every career? time. <laughs> Every time. You know, any time you have a head injury, your, your brain is your computer, you know. And people don't have the faith in it healing like a broken bone. There's instances in the past where guys have had head injuries and, and visually you can see that it's affected them permanently. And so if you go to somebody and go, man, you know, I'm, I rung my bell and I'm real messed up and I'm going to take a break and I'm going to come back 100%. Uh, you know that person's always going to have that in the back of their mind. And when you don't run a good race, so they're going to go, hmm, I wonder if he's just not the same anymore, you know? I've heard that talk about other drivers. Even guys that don't have any history of concussions. I've heard people say, you know, he did have a lot of hard wrecks. To what extent do you think NASCAR does enough to protect its drivers? Um, you know, for the knowledge that they have, I think they do a really good job. They couldn't, they have made the impact test of uh, mandatory. I'm, th I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful they have a neurosurgeon that travels with us every race. If you were uh, the guy at the helm with NASCAR and you could make any changes with regards to um, health or medical policy, what would you do differently? Um, the only thing that I would do differently is I would probably try to do as much as I could to protect the drivers from themselves. You know, the drivers are never going to raise their hand. It's, you know, it took me a lot to go, hey, I got a problem. It took me, I got way too far down the line before I raised my hand. Because right? you were even keeping it a secret when you were openly right. telling people they needed to be transparent. Exactly. Right. So I am aware that drivers are their own worst enemy in that scenario. And they're going to do everything they can to keep racing, keep their job, not let anyone in on this information and the secret. I would try to do everything I could to protect the drivers from themselves. That would be my main goal. And it would be annoying at times to the drivers, you know, but my intentions would be to take care of them. Because man, when I wrecked in my 20s, I didn't know I was hurt. I didn't know, oh, this is a problem. You know, I'd get out of the car and go, yeah, I feel funky. You know, I did have a hard crash. I'm going home, see you later. You know, I would, if I was a neurosurgeon and I'm at the racetrack and a guy hits a heart, hits really, really hard, or it's an, it's an interesting, unique kind of impact, I would be like, hey man, I want to spend, let's hold this guy here, you know. I know this is inconvenient, but I want to keep you here for an hour and make sure you're fine. Run you through a few tests and get you, maybe even get you to do the impact test. Compare that to your 
baseline, things like that. What is it about having gone through the concussions with her that had you not done that, you wouldn't have realized how much she truly cared for you? I never had been that vulnerable, you know, vulnerable before, and I'd never been in need of someone like that before. Like I needed someone every minute of the day. You know, without, without Amy, I probably would have suffered um, emotionally uh, real severely. And uh, so having her there every day was really, really reassuring. And we would get up and I'm like, I'm tired, you know, and she's like going, all right, we're going to do your exercises right now. You're getting your butt out of bed and we're going to do them. And I'm, I'm like, you know, if she wasn't there, I might have skipped a few days. I might have skipped a week. You think so? Yeah. I would have been in such a dis I would have been in such despair emotionally being alone and waking up every day with that, with those symptoms and, and on my own that I would have probably given up. And so... You really think that? You would have given up? Yeah, I'd have probably given up. It's, the, it's a very de deep, dark hole, you know? And it's not one you can climb out of by yourself. And so there's this person next to me going, okay, man, I want you to do these exercises because I need you, to, need you to get better. I need you. Um, that just answered all any doubt. If I had a sliver of doubt about what she was in this for, it, it made it crystal clear that she was in this relationship because she loved who I was. You know, and that was a tough, that was a tough question or a tough thing to answer up to that point. Here I am, I got millions of dollars, um, I got everything at my fingertips, and so anytime anybody wanted to be a part of my life, it made me always kind of wonder what their intentions were. And I would almost, it's embarrassing that I would even question Amy's intentions now because I know them to be so true. But I just, I wasn't really sure that I trusted anybody, you know? And so, but going through that, man, it made it perfectly clear that she didn't care about what money we had or any of those things, none of that mattered. That she just wanted me for her, you know, she just wanted me. and. Uh, you know, so that was great. <laughs> the hardest part for you of the whole process was what? The hardest part for me was Dale and his stubbornness and making sure he stayed at it. And sometimes in the middle of some of these things we're doing, um, he's bitching and moaning and complaining <laughs> and uh, not having a good time and telling me he didn't see any differences. But just like when he had those first concussion symptoms, he was taking notes of how he would feel. And we had video, which we've since deleted. He didn't want me to keep it, but um, we had video records of how far he could walk across the floor with his eyes closed from one week to the next. So he could really see how much it was helping him. Kelly, yeah, um, explain the role that she plays. Uh, it's a long story. Um, my sister and I, when our, when we, so when my mom's house caught on fire and... When you were around six. I was six years old. Yeah. I know, I'm going way back. When, when our house caught on fire, we were moved. My mom gave up custody of us. She had no money and no house and no, you know, no direction. She couldn't take care of us, you know, it was diff difficult. But dad was flourishing. He was racing and winning and money and, and all that. So she gave up custody of us to dad. We go over there and we, he's marrying Teresa. So we got this Teresa, we got to get to know this and she's our stepmother. And uh, so me and my sister, man, we, we really got close. It's like, I, hey man, you know, what do you think about what's going on? And, and we leaned on each other to sort of get adapt to that environment, which was so unfamiliar. But Kelly really became my caretaker and, and caregiver, you know, she, she gave, she made sure I had, you know, she made sure I wasn't dressed like a fool for school and she made sure I had money in my pocket for lunch and she made sure I'd done my homework and wasn't gonna get in trouble or done my chores. We had daily chores. She made sure they were done and I was doing what I was supposed to do to keep me out of trouble and she 
coddled me and, and, and really took care of me. Dad wasn't taking care of me. I mean, he was racing and gone, and, and Teresa was with him, but Kelly was there. Kelly was the one that was there with me every day. We had housekeepers, and we had two, three, four different nannies, you know, that, that were around that we, I never made or created relationships with. And my sister was the one that I went to every day for everything. And then... She, she's in high school. Yeah. You get shipped to military school. Yeah, what so, does she do? Right. So I go, that, I'm, I'm a troubled mess and creating problems in school and getting, uh, you know, about to get kicked out. And dad and Teresa sent me to military school. I was there a month and Kelly came on her own accord. Like who goes to military? Military school is like punishment, right? And midway through when she was yeah. in high school. She's halfway through high school. She leaves her friends and everybody to, to, to go to military school and, and in the 10th grade? What, what kind of 10th grader says, you know what, I miss my brother, I'm gonna to go to military school where he's at? I don't know what um, propelled me really to kind of be his protector, but other than to say that Dale just always chose a different path for attention. So he always got in trouble. I'm not a psychologist, I don't understand it, but. Um, he, that's just the way he chose to go about getting the attention. And um, so I always was just protecting and protecting and like, God, you know, I mean, how much more trouble can you stand to get in, kid, you know, and just looking out for him and feeling sorry for him and all this kind of stuff, which just led into doing these different things, you know, following him to military school. And he was a scrawny little butt. I mean, have you seen pictures of him then? Yeah. He was a tiny little thing and he got called names all the time at school. You know, they call him chicken legs and all this kind of stuff because he had these little white scrawny legs and he was always, you know, this tall and his classmates were this tall. And um, yeah, so I just always looked out for him. So I followed him around to military school and a lot of other things. <laughs> and um, eventually, long, long story short, when I started making some money in racing, she called me and she says, hey, you're gonna need somebody to help you with your finances and your business and what you know you, I've had checks that I don't even know what to do with thousands of dollars a million dollars here and there this is all I mean one year I was making three hundred fifty dollars a week and I went to making five million dollars in a year at a and I've and you would think you would be like yeah like what the hell this is amazing <laughs> and I'm like I don't know what the, the hell to do you know my sister had at this point worked her way up the chain of command in the merchandise business of NASCAR, which was flourishing. And she's worked to get this real genuine opportunity and she's gonna turn that up, you know, just give it away. I said, for one, I can't afford you. She's like, I'll take a 50% pay cut to come. And she did. And you know what is so terrible to admit is that for years, I never once did an evaluation or gave her a raise. Because I'm, I had no idea. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Almost when did that come up? Oh, it came up. I don't even know what exactly when it came up, but um, and I backpaid her for you know for that mistake. But um, she wouldn't even you know say hey you know I haven't had you know I haven't evaluated my performance and I haven't had a raise you know I haven't really gotten a raise in a long time. She finally did. And it, and it came up begrudgingly. It's like she wasn't really excited to have that conversation, but I felt like a fool because she's my MVP. What was your motivation behind doing it? Well, um, you know, Dale and I, it sort of, I guess, goes back to our childhood. I became just, I guess, like the mother hen kind of girl. And so it, I mean, we've, we've just always had that bond of taking care of each other. So when our dad passed away, I knew that Dale Jr. needed someone to look out for him. And so I, you know, taking the pay cut, I guess, was just part of that looking out for each other kind of thing that we had really been doing for lots of years before that as brother and sister. Um, so it really wasn't that big of a deal to me to, to do that, you know. So what were your goals at the time? And then how did they evolve as time passed? You know, my goals when I came to work for Dale was really just to, to look out for him and to do things that were in his best interest. And I didn't feel like that, I knew my dad always did that, but I wasn't so sure about the other half of that equation. So, um, 
you know, I didn't want him to get taken advantage of. And, and Dale is, his personality is one of no conflict. So he will let people walk over him to a certain extent. When you were growing up, I mean, your dad basically had the th three families. He had his first wife, your half-brother, Carrie, your mom, you, your sister, and then his third wife, Teresa, and Taylor. How tough was it to get his attention when you were growing up? He was a hard person to impress, as you could probably imagine. And I don't know that he was really thrilled with me as a kid. I never measured up to his hopes for my initiative and my determination. Um, he, I remember he would say all the time, you know, when I was 12 years old, 13 years old, man, when I was your age, I was in the shop cleaning tools, sweeping floors, doing whatever I could. You know, and I'm thinking, I want to be outside playing with my friends. I don't want to be in there cleaning tools. So he was disappointed that I wasn't like hardcore you know, I'll sweep the floors. I don't care to be in the race shop, anything, to be in the race shop. I'll do whatever it takes. How did it make you feel knowing that you didn't quite live up to what you felt like he wanted? Um, we just didn't have a relationship. We didn't, we didn't do a lot of hanging out. We didn't communicate much unless he was telling me where to stand or where to be or what to fix or what to clean up. Um, we didn't... We were, we didn't go hunting together. We didn't. He didn't take me on trips. Uh, he, I was never like when he would go do things. I would. I was never like an idea or a consideration. I really didn't get to start communicating with him and building a relationship with him until I drove and raced. Uh, how much did you get into racing in the first place to make him yeah. proud, be around dad? That, the only reason I raced was to get closer to my dad. That was the only way I would. Like, I, nothing I did would register with him, you know? And, and I wasn't, not that I was doing a lot. I was average, decent. I was, I was like a CD student in school, so I wasn't impressing him that way. Um, I didn't have any real athletic attributes to to you know bring home uh, a trophy for any kind of sports you know in school and finally when I started racing and I won a couple races I noticed like we would talk about it you know and he'd come in the shop and want to know what happened and so like I got more and more into like hey I got to I want to be in, I want to do racing because it gets me closer to dad. And, you know, so that's, luckily that happened. Uh, how often, if ever, would he go to school functions or Never. sporting events? Never, he missed events, graduation. Or? I played soccer when I was a freshman in high school. I've never seen a game. He never went to any of those games. But uh, he missed my graduation. I was really disappointed with that. I mean, I have no pictures of my high school graduation. Not a, not a damn decent photo. <laughs> I went to it and had my gown on and went home. You know, it just, dad wasn't there. They were racing somewhere. How do you think that impacted how you want to be as a father? It doesn't cross my mind like, man, I'm going to do it differently, you know, than it happened to me. I don't even realize how it happened to me until I sit down and think about it. I don't even consider it, you know, in day to day. So when I deal with Isla, really, I think, God, I wish dad could be here to see her, you know, because I know that he probably isn't that same person. You know, when he died, he wasn't the guy that would miss his son's graduation. He was that guy in 92 when it happened. But in 2001, he wasn't that person anymore. Were there ways in which looking back now, you know you missed the attention that you wanted? Oh, yeah, but my dad thought it was okay to, you know, you have you had a roof over your head and you, you know, got to go to school and you got fed and, you know, you got a car when you turned 16 or as long as those needs were met, yeah. you know, you didn't need the emotional piece right. of it, you know. 
Um, and, but that's what you longed for was the emotional piece of it. You know, you, you, um, you wanted to sit down at dinner and have a family dinner. I mean, we sat at the dinner table and ate by ourselves, you know. We didn't go on vacation with our dad, and when we did go on vacation, it was to Daytona Beach to the race. He went to the racetrack, we stayed at the hotel and swam in a pool with people, other, you know, other race kids, you know. It was just very rigid and our dad didn't have a lot of time to spend with us and didn't choose to spend time with us and, um, yeah, it was just really different, yeah. How much did you find that changed later on in life? I think it was on the cusp of changing when we lost our dad, you know, my dad had, um, another daughter, Taylor, who's um, 16 years younger than I am. And, you know, and I don't, like, I don't say any of this negatively about my dad. It's my experience and it's what's made me who I am. So I'm very appreciative for that. Um, but, you know, when we were kids, he was trying to make a name for himself. He was making a lot of sacrifices. His priorities were in a different place of wanting to be a race car driver and what you had to do to make that happen. When Taylor was born, our sister, all that was done. He was a successful race car driver. And then he had the opportunity that he could provide for her and, you know, provide the, a lifestyle for her where he could be involved and spend time with her. The Pepsi 400, it was your first time back at Daytona following his passing. Why do you walk to turn four and yeah. what are All you right, thinking well, about? That was an off weekend before Daytona, and so me and my buddies would rent a house and we'd go in early and we'd raise hell and party all down, up down Daytona Beach for the weekend. And we're driving in, we drove to Daytona back then, even though we had planes and stuff. I always, I drove to the Daytona July race up until around 2006, just out of principle, because it was such a fun race and a fun trip that I'd been going on for years. So we drive down there, as soon as we're going by the track, I'm like, I wanna take you guys in the track, man. You know, you gotta see Daytona, nobody's here yet. Empty place, be great, we'll have it to ourselves. We just kinda sneaking around, like how do we get in here? And we drove, we found a hole in the gate you know, found an open gate on the track and we drive out on the track and we pulled up to the start finish line. We got out, we took pictures and I'm like, I'm, ta I'm treating my buddies. I got six or eight guys in this damn Suburban, been riding eight hours to Daytona and I'm like, you know, this is part of the experience. It's part of our week. We're gonna see the track. So uh, as we're driving around the track, I took them around one and two and we're going down back straightaway. This Guy comes running up in this truck, slams on brakes, stops and goes, hey, what are y'all doing? You ain't <laughs> supposed to be out here. And I was like, well, I'm Dale Jr. I'm just taking my buddies around. I'm sorry. We should have probably called or stopped or saw somebody before we came in here. All right. I said, I'm just going to go finish and go right back out the gate over there on the front straightaway. We're just going to finish this lap. I hadn't even thought about the dad and the turn three stuff. So the guy's like, okay, well, as soon as you're done, get on out of here. So we drive on around and I got to the corner. I'm like, well, you know, here it is. Dad's, this is where dad crashed. All the guys in the car knew, you know, what we were, what we were driving up on. I said, let's just stop for a second. I need to stop, just stand here a bit. And I had a couple of decisions to make. I could sit there and go, I don't ever want to come back here again. I don't ever want to be near this place again. This is where he died. Screw this. Keep me as far away from this freaking track as possible. Or, you know, I could embrace it and go, this is where he died. This is a special place. This is now a place that brings me closer to him. You know, when, I'm in, when I stand in, in this spot on the racetrack, I feel closer to my daddy. This is where he lost his life. He breathed his last breath right here. And so that's what I decided to do because I knew I was going to keep racing and I knew I was going to have to keep coming back to that track and I couldn't let that be a miserable experience every time I went. And so I kind of embraced that a little bit, you know, to make it where it was easier to come back. And that was a great decision. I don't even think about it. When I go to Daytona, I don't like have this urge to go over to the corner and be there. I don't have this urge to be far from it. It's just me, we're cool, you know? Describe the emotion of winning that first race back at Daytona. I knew we had a real fast car. Uh, in practice, we were flying, doing things that we just hadn't never been able to do. And then the, the scenario at the end of the race, I mean, the way the strategy worked out was some guys taking, we had a late caution and it shuffled us out of the lead. And we had, I mean, it, my crew chief at the time does an interview right before the last restart. And he's like, well, the best car might not win tonight. You know, he's kind of setting himself up for, um, 
disappointment that we may lose this race after being dominant all night. And when the when we got the restart, we drove right into the lead and won the race and it felt like a movie. This is as amazing as it could be. I couldn't have wrote a better storyline than this. I couldn't have. So it was awesome. How well do you recall him sitting upstairs at his office, you walking in and reading to him the NASCAR.com oh, story yeah. that you wrote? Yeah, so I, I don't know what was going on in our lives at the time, but I had this, I felt like it was this perfect moment where I just sat down and put down to paper everything I thought about my dad and how great he was and all the sort of scenarios that I'd witnessed or seen where he was this bigger than life fi figure and, uh, and done impressive things or whatever. So I just wrote it down and I had, did it all by myself without a damn bit of help. Not one person saw this. And so when I got done with it, I took it over to dad's office and I said, hey, you know, I got five minutes, which was rare. He said, yeah. Um, I was like, I want to read this to you. And I read it. And I thought that he would just chuckle and say, yeah, that's pretty cool, man. But he was like, he said, I'm so glad that I read this to him because I really wasn't convinced it was going to be a big deal to him. But he said, you know, we talk about each other and tell each other we love each other and we, we spend time together and I think that we have, you know, I think that we have love and all that stuff. He said, but nothing ever has made it uh, apparent and clear like this has. He's like, hearing that has really shows me how you feel. And so he was saying things that he never says, you know, he never talks like that. And I was like, well, I want everybody else to know it, Dad, so I'm going to put it on NASCAR.com. He goes, you should save that for a book one day. I was like, no, I'm too excited to scream this from the mountaintops. I want everybody to read this and know this is like the perfect summary of who you are. But I'm glad I told him, I'm glad I read that. I'm glad I had the idea to write it and then to share it because, you know, it made his passing a little easier to take knowing that he understood my feelings for him pretty clearly. Prior to him passing, your dad and stepmom, as I understand it, would make most of your decisions yeah. for you. How quickly did that change after? Immediately after my dad died, I, was, I had this very weird feeling of independence. It wasn't comfortable. I was just thinking about all the things that I depended on dad for, for for advice and direction and uh, was just going to be not there. And how was that? And it was a weird, weird feeling. There was a bit of a release of some pressure that I can't quite describe. And I don't know, um, like I was worried about like how in the hell am I going to live the rest of my life without my dad? You're, it's almost like, man, is this really even happening? Am I in some kind of a dream? Is this surreal? But I had always been in his shadow, and I was always going to be in his shadow. And I knew that, and I was fine with that. As long as he was there, you know, um, I traded being in his shadow to be close to him, you know. When that was taken away, man, it was a lot of weird emotions. I had, I felt sadness, loss, and terrible, terrible, terrible sadness and loss, but I felt some strange independence and loneliness, some relief of being out of this shadow. I, I can't explain it. I don't wish it on anyone. It was not, it was very confusing. You raced for the team that bared his name, now, all of a sudden, your stepmom's the owner. How tough was that transition for you to her as owner? Well, she had been around, and, and, uh, and so it wasn't that tough. And there were a lot of people at the company that I knew and trusted that were like, hey, we're going to keep this going. We're going to do this for Dale. And we rode on that for about four or five years. 
What changed? Over that period of time, there was some personnel changes. Some of those people that had that, you know, that had been there from the start weren't in those positions anymore. I was starting to get a little bit of leverage on some of the decisions for my team personally that was probably, I was probably too, uh, I was definitely um, not ready for that responsibility to make those decisions. My contract was coming up. My relationship with my sponsor Budweiser was coming to, uh, was ending, that contract was ending. Would, would they would they stay on board, resign? What was their plan? There was just a lot of crossroads, a lot of bridges coming up around 2005. Uh, just a, several little personnel decisions took some of the wind out of the sails f for me. And it wasn't, and I, tr we, I tried and we tried to sort of correct it and put the pieces back in place, but it never fit back prop perfectly and it never felt the same as it did maybe around 2003, 2004. And, uh, you know, I had some opportunities to do some things different. I had opportunities to get in uh, better equipment, better cars, make a tremendous amount more money. You know, it's hard to turn that down. It's hard to know whether you're going to regret that the rest of your life. I've been with my dad's team all this time, and we've done a lot of great things. You know, and he's not here anymore, and it's been a few years, and I think we've gotten everything we can out of this situation. Even if the opportunities were both the exact same, to what extent did you know that the relationship with the stepmom was at a place where it just was in your best interest to move on? It wasn't always warm and fuzzy, and and uh, and and that, but that was okay. I'll say one thing about Teresa, and and it's she was always fair. She never made an unfair proposition. I never felt like, man, you know, I'm not getting good enough equipment. We just didn't have much of a relationship, you know, and if the opportunities were the same, I probably would have stayed. I don't know. It's hard to say. I can't even imagine what I would have done if things were different one way or the other. How aware were you at the time of starting junior motorsports that likely uh, Dale would eventually end up needing to leave DEI? Well, it was sort of a process, you know, um, in 2004, we did a new contract with Teresa. Um, and over that period of time, things just were not happening as cohesive as they needed to happen. You know, we were getting left out of things or not having a seat at the table to be involved in certain things. Dale Hart Incorporated was going through a change in terms of the presidents there. They had a number of presidents that were coming in during that time when, you know, we'd have a new meeting and get them up to speed and then before you knew it, they weren't there anymore and we'd have to have a meeting with another person and get them up to speed. And it was really hard to, you know, she had she wanted things a certain way, and if we didn't feel that was the way that they should be, it was really hard to have that discussion with her. It was just pretty much the way she wanted it or that was gonna be it. So it ended up that that was it. <laughs> and in 2007, we made a change, so that worked out. How big of a change was that for the two of you together? It was a big deal. It was hard trying to decide that you were leaving your family business knowing that that's what your dad built that business for. Um, it was softened with the fact that you knew that she, you know, the indications that we were given by her actions were that she didn't see things the same way. And um, that, you know, she didn't really see that that was built for the continuation of my dad and, and his kids and that legacy to build on. And that she was pretty, you know, in my opinion, she was very um, stubborn and selfish about that, you know, in a way that caused us to leave. So it was kind of easier to make that decision, um, but still very hard to, to, to leave your family business. I think the thing that worked for me and Dale is that that's kind of the boat that we were always in as kids. And it was always... Me meaning what? Dale and I, I mean, we were always in the situation that we needed to look out for each other, you know, and if, if um, 
so we had each other to lean on and that relationship to lean on to know that we could, you know, get out from underneath that and be okay and just do our thing. Your contract was coming up. Um, you're at the racetrack, get back to your trailer and uh, your wife Amy says to you, Rick, um, you know, wants to see you on his uh, bus. Take me into that room when you walked in to discuss contracts and what you said. I, um, I'd been feeling some of the concussion symptoms, but I didn't really know that. It was still before I had went to see the doctor, but I'm for like two weeks, I'm having some vision blurry, blurry vision at distance and very um, short fuse, you know, really snappy. Uh, I go into Rick's bus and we sit down and he's like, I need to start talking about, you know, what we're gonna do. We're going I wanna renew the contract before even the media starts asking us questions about it. And I was like, you know what, Rick, I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure I wanna keep driving. I don't, I don't know whether I wanna race or not. I'm not having any fun and I'm, you know, I just go on and on and on about the frustrations of. And you were getting pretty riled up too, yeah, right? Yeah, so I don't remember yelling about all this, uh, but Rick is in his interview for our book recalls me being very animated and, and loud, you know, <laughs> and so I didn't give him an, uh, you know, an answer and, and I hadn't had my mind made up on what I was going to do when I left. I mean, I just went in there and pretty much just unloaded all my anxiety and frustrations and walked out. And then a week later, I was in the hospital getting looked at. It was after a race at California Speedway um, that you call him and tell him you want to meet with just him. Yeah. Uh, take me into that room and what was said. I said, I want to, I want to talk. And he came to my house, sat on the couch and I said, Hey, I made a decision. I don't want to, I don't want to run after 2017. I want to, I finish our contract that we have and I want to be done. I wanted to go back to the well one more time and race in 17 and hopefully get through that healthy and then just say, all right, you know, let's not push our luck and keep on getting hurt. And what is this doing to me long term? You know, if I keep on keeping on hitting the fence and, and having these little episodes over and over and over, is it is this really something I'm gonna regret terribly when I'm 60, 50 even? And so, you know, it was hard because he's like, I want you, I want you to I love racing, working with you. I love you being part of my company and part of my team. And that made me feel great to hear that. But he also was like, hey, man, you know, you, uh, uh, that, isn't, that is all secondary to our relationship as friends. And, and you mean too much to me uh, for you to be compromised. And I want you to do what you think is best for you and take care of yourself. So it's your last race before the race. He comes up and yeah. grabs you by the neck, giving you a big hug. The only time I ever cried during the whole retirement mess was when Rick was around. Why? I didn't want to disappoint him. He was like a father to me. He was like a dad. You know, I don't say that casually. We're here today to confirm uh, the news you received this morning that I've decided to make this season my last as a NASCAR Cup driver. Why was it relief that you felt after the retirement announcement? I was just glad to be out of the car and out of the crashing. No more head banging and getting hurt and getting sick. How much did it drive you crazy that there are some like uninformed folks in the media that are like, oh, he's retiring because, because of Amy, of Amy. Or Amy's mm -hmm. making him retire? A lot of that was not surprising. I think it was just an easy target. I'm an easy target for something like that. Without a lot of information too, they're just gonna assume. And it was ironic timing considering he was going to, coming, kind of coming to the end of his career anyway. And we were getting married, I just got pregnant. It was just kind of all cumulative and easy. It didn't bother me. I, I, I felt like I've developed a, a thick skin, but it's just easy to see that that was just an easy target. So it didn't bother me too bad. And plus I stayed off of social media when we were really going through the really bad parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, just because he and I both didn't want to see what everybody was saying.
Your sponsor, Mountain Dew, is owned by PepsiCo. I was talking to their uh, marketing VP, Tedesco. Adam Harder, oh. and um, he was telling me how before you made the retirement announcement, you called him up and gave him a heads up as to what was going on, and he said it was unexpected, so classy, and <laughs> meant the world to him. Wow. Um, why was that important to you? Well, I think that when you have such, when you have partners like my Mountain Dew and, and, and Nationwide, and those people put so much into that investment. They put so much effort and, and man hours and time into that investment. I think that's the right thing to do to let them know they can't find out about this decision from someone else or some other way. You know, they're a big reason why you're able to compete is to have the support from those sponsors. So, What's your perspective on why he wrote the book? Well, I think there's a few reasons. I think he wrote the book because he wanted to share his perspective and really share everything he went through. Um, when he was going through it, he kept a lot to himself, not just like the notes that he kept from everyone, but he kept a lot of the real dirty grind of what he was going through from the media and from his fans. So I think he wanted to make sure that they knew what he went through and why he was really retiring. And then I think he wanted to make sure that if in sharing the story, he could possibly help someone else going through something similar. Um, That's important to him. It's really important to him. I think that drove him sharing it more than just because of his race fans and wanting to put closure to that. When you reflect back on your racing career, now that it's effectively all said and done, how do you view it? I'm very proud of my racing career. A lot of people talk about how we were overrated. I hear that a lot. Um, people have a hard time sort of understanding how to feel about the popularity versus the results, right? Um, so a lot of fans struggle with that, especially people that aren't fans of mine. They're like, well, he was way more popular than the results show. And popularity and success on the track really don't go hand in hand. And we see that with Jimmy Johnson. He's one of the best drivers that sports ever seen, uh, but never won the most popular driver award. And they don't go hand in hand. Popularity is more about um, your legacy your family history, obviously. I gained a ton of fans from my father, but it's also about who you are and how you are perceived, um, being relatable and all those things. So I think we did a great job uh, carrying on that legacy and building on it. And do, we did a good job of being a great representative for ourselves, our sponsors in the sport going forward through all those years. We never screwed it up. You know, we didn't, we didn't do something stupid and or get out and say something stupid and act like an ass and and disappoint a bunch of fans. We built that fan base and created more fans. And we we uh, broke into the mainstream with Rolling Stone articles, MTV Cribs. Uh, we did things outside of the NASCAR bubble that helped grow the sport. And the Anheuser Busch sponsorship. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of great things that I think I'm very proud of that helped NASCAR. And outside of myself, it helped NASCAR get bigger. We won races, you know, that I never thought I would be winning. I never assumed one second that I was going to be a success. Never one time when I was racing late models did I assume I was going to be a champion or a winner. Never. And I think any time I won, it was always a surprise. I never dr dreamed of being popular and becoming the most popular driver in NASCAR. Never thought any of that would have ever happened to me.